Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I'm sitting down in a little low energy because I managed to, for the first time, get COVID about a month ago, and I'm not quite fully recovered yet. Um, so, anyhow, my mother's maiden name was Leroy, which I expect is a name none of you have ever heard before. Um, it's from the same part of Yorkshire where there were Murgatroyds and Oldroyds and Ackroyds and Holroyds. And so it's, for some reason, it didn't take off the way some of those names did. So let me see. Why am I still just not working? Did I turn it off or something? So basically, a one-name study is you're tracing every occurrence of a particular surname. Now, in my case, as far as I can tell, all of the Leroyds are related. Sometimes you have names where you don't know that. Um, but basically, it's looking everywhere for any occurrence of the name. Um, and so people end up with just reams of data like this. And because my study is small enough, I am trying to organize them into family sets in a way that some people who do slightly more um, diffuse names may not. Oops, went the wrong way. So why do people do these? Um, some people start out and it's just, it's their family and they have a name like Leroy, like I do, where they're just trying to figure out how everybody fits in. Um, some people do it because they are looking at a particular place or a house where there was a family that lived there for multiple generations. Um, some people are just, I know a couple people who just thought a last name was interesting and they wanted to figure out how they all fit together. Um, so there are a lot of motivations for doing it. There is a guild of one name studies, heavily focused on, on England, um, but with lots of help. So if you ever decide you want to do something like this, it's it's like 15 pounds, which is like $23 a year. And there is a lot of support for um, if you're doing this kind of study on a whole family rather than just a particular line within a family. And here you can see this is just the beginning of the A's. And you do get people, and one of the things I'll talk about in a minute, so you see you have Attaway, and then it's slightly spelled differently. People will put in all the variants because, as I'm sure most of you realize, before the 20th century, spelling just didn't count. And so you're going to get variations on the names. I have not registered the um, variants on Leroy. There are just too many of them. So I haven't done that. Now, obviously, you're not going to start to do one on a name like Smith or Davis. Now, what I thought was, and the reason I put this in, I thought it was interesting that, oops, the top five names in the US are all in the top bit here. Davis is in the top 10 for the US. Davies is in the top 10 for the UK. Um, not surprisingly, you have Patel, good South Asian name in the UK. In the US, you have Garcia and Rodriguez. Now, what's interesting is Miller. Anybody know why Miller is so common in the US and not in the Yeah. When, but it's, it's even a step further than that. 
is that at the time that surnames were becoming settled in England, the um, Millers would have had a reputation where if it was happening today, it would be the equivalent of saying used car salesman is someone's last name. So the vast majority of Millers in the US are actually descended from German Müllers because it, in Germany, there wasn't quite that reputation. Does that make sense to everybody? So, uh, but yes, if, if you're looking at Robinsons or Johnsons, don't bother. You know, there's just no way to do this. So looking at the UK census from 1841 to 1911, you have, oops, I'm having a real hard time with this. You know, in 1841, there were about 130 people in the census named Leroyd or with the common variants. 1911, it's almost 500. Now, a lot of people will be in multiple of these. In fact, you could have people who were three years old in 1841 still be in the 1911 census. But this gives you an idea of why this is on a scale that I can do this because you're looking at any particular time at somewhere under 500 people in the UK with the name. So it's, it's a manageable project. Um, it is the, or was originally very localized. You see here at the moment, this is a modern surname distribution map. And it's around a lot of, the, the, of England, but still concentrated here in the north. If we go back to the 1911 census, the more red something is, the more frequent the last name is. So you can see at this point, it's, it's fairly concentrated. The, this big county here is Yorkshire. Um, and go back to 1841, and you can see it's really going back to its roots here. Um, and it's pretty much, except for one family in Suffolk here, everybody else with the name is up north in 1841. And this is basically the way it would have been before the disruption caused by industrialization and by the coming of the railroads that made moving away from someplace easier. But what's interesting is even within Yorkshire, this is a map of the western part of Yorkshire showing all the parish names. And see these little green stars? Those are the parishes I have found Leroy's in before 1800. So this is an area that is about 30 miles by 20 miles that they all started out in. Um, and this is the superimposing it on the modern map. Um, Bradford was the city my mother was told the family was from. Um, and again, you can see the little stars I put on of where people were living at one particular point. This is a little town called Brig House that's there near Bradford. Um, there were a lot of Quakers named Leroy at the Brig House meeting. And so just to show you the sorts of, these maps are actually the Ordnance Survey maps, which is the UK equivalent of the USGS. And these are all online at the National Library of Scotland, which is maps.nls.uk. And they um, have amazing maps. And they've done all the ones for England as well as Scotland. And you know, here's the detail you're getting. This is an 1850s, late 1840s survey, early 1850s actually printed. And you can see that you know they've got the shape of the buildings. <laughs> it really was. I mean, the amount that you can do with these is amazing. 
Um, one of the women who married a Leroy was from this little settlement called Stone Top, which is in a um, town that's been basically absorbed by the city of Leeds. And what's interesting is, see these buildings right here? These were surveyed in 1849-ish. And you get the railroad, and notice the um, these are field boundaries. Here's a modern map. Notice the little bit of buildings, the railroad bed, field boundaries. I mean, you can you can pretty much. Yeah, I know the, the quality is not as good here as, uh, but you can look at this and almost practically see the shape of the building still. And this is the really neat thing at the National Library of Scotland map. This is the 1850s map superimposed on the modern satellite image. Look at how you can see the field boundaries. There's the road. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. <laughs> I could do an entire program on the National Library of Scotland and other really fancy maps. So, but isn't this neat to be able to see this? And you, know, you can see the modern suburban housing development sort of encroaching on the farmland. So I just put, I put that in because it's not really completely relevant. I just think it's neat. So there are lots of variants I've seen in the records. I'm, my, this is not all of them. My full count is up to something like 47. Um, which is difficult when you start, you know, it's not that bad at Ancestry or Find My Past where they have built-in variation um, tools. When you start searching newspapers, in the newspapers I only found about a dozen variants. They are a little better at the spelling. Um, but one of the things when you start a one name study is figuring out which are the legitimate variants and which are other names. So for example, these names for the most part come up with a Soundex style search, but there really isn't overlap with these. On the other hand, I have in a couple cases with other evidence from other records, geographic placement and such, have found these two meant to be a Leroy. So this is one, you know, Laird, Lord, and surprisingly Leroy are, I've not really found for, as a variant of Leroy, but these two I have, which I thought was an interesting, because this one in particular, at least the way I pronounce it, it's one syllable, not two. So, and there is, this is copied from the Guild of One Name Studies. And I thought it was an interesting, um, I'm not sure I like the name, the word, calling them deviant, but they dis, we distinguish often between a variant and a deviant. And the idea is a variant is something that's used consistently. It's how somebody signed their name. It's in lots of records. Whereas the deviant is the misspelling. It's the something that was used once or twice because the minister was spelling it the way he thought he heard it. And I have talked about this with people you know, as I'm working with patrons who are still struggling about the idea that spelling doesn't count because they're like, well, that's not how my, our name is spelled. I'm like, trust me. Don't worry about it. Um, but this this helps, you know, this is typos, this is, you know, smudged ink, all of those things versus legitimate. Somebody routinely, for example, spells Leroy when they write it with L E E instead of L E A. So that's a variant, whereas if someone accidentally types, you know, N instead of R, that's a variant. 
or sorry, a deviant. Does that make sense to you guys? Well, thinking about, you know, legitimate, what, what uh, sort of what I think of as legitimate variations versus the things that happen because we're human. Right. Yeah, I, I found, one, I had one patron come in and they, they were struggling and they couldn't find their family. And now I don't remember which way it was, but it had been indexed as heart and it should have been hunch or vice versa. But because, you know, they didn't go beyond the index. And it's like, you know, we figured out you know, it's this town, it's only 30 pages of census, skim through it, and we found them. But, you know, when you overly rely on the index, you end up with problems, mostly from the deviants, because they're the ones that don't get caught in the variations that put in, in the way Ancestry and the other big companies have built their um, internal search software. It's really easy to get used to the um, genealogy websites having done some of the work for us on this. So you, know, you end up following a surname with a one name study generally. And if you're doing it in your own family, and, you know, you could start here and go out. Or um, I'm actually thinking when I have my Leroy's a little further along, um, this woman here, her last name was Midgley, and there's not a study for that. And it's another very Yorkshire name. And I'm thinking that it would be an interesting one to do. But again, it would then follow her straight paternal line and all the relatives from that. One of the problems I had is Kipling used Leroy as a character name. I do an awful lot of searching at Google where I put Leroy and a minus sign Kipling. Yeah, so if, if you are at Google and you're searching for something, if you don't want a word, you can put a minus sign, no space, and the word you do not want. And so, for example, if you're looking for jaguars, the cat, you can put minus automobile and anything that, and, or minus car, and you will not get anything that has. Now, you can sometimes get some false negatives because you may have a, a page that talks about being in a car on a safari and seeing a jaguar. But for something like this, I'm not going to miss too much if I put the minus Kipling in. And I'm going to avoid a whole bunch of other um, search results that I have no interest in because it's a fictional character. Um, yet yeah, my whole ser search as a librarian and talking about how to another topic but the um but the advanced tools at google can come in very handy for searching um so let's take a look at my Leroy family this is my mother when she was about i don't know 15 or 16. these are her two younger half brothers um one of the few times my mother saw her father after she was about three or four years old um We'll come back to that. Um, this is my grandfather's sister and her mother and her grandmother and her great grandmother. So her mother was Jesse Sears, who married a Leroy. And so Helen was born in the Leroy family. So this is on your handout. Um, this is my Leroy family from my grandfather back through his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and this is the immigrant couple. And one of the reasons I started this whole project, which was 15 years ago before there were such good records online, is this. So we have what I was able to find in the US, 
and then I find this family that looks like it should fit. But I'm sure many of you have this same issue. Is this John Leroy, who died in Boston in 1808, the same John Leroy that was born in 1772, whose birth was re recorded at the Brig House Monthly Meeting of Friends in Yorkshire? How many of you have a problem like this, right? You know, is it this guy in Maine, the same one who left, who lived, at, was born in Massachusetts, or you know, how many of a particular, you know, Jean Pierre Gagné or whoever from Quebec is the one who settles in Lewiston? So this is what started me on this whole project, was to take what I knew about the family and see if I could make this connection strong enough because there's nothing in what I can find about him in contemporary records that solidifies this. Okay. So I did have this typescript, three pages long. This is the first page, which the later pages are, are the gener the two generation the two later pages are, are the generations in the US. So for this I don't need them. Um and it's essentially I don't know who wrote this. It's not clear. There's no name. I can tell from the third page with which children are there and which ones aren't that it was written between nineteen twenty seven and nineteen 36, I think. Um, so let's see. So here's the couple things that I was interested in. So it says, John, this is the original immigrant, John Leroy, was a Quaker, but Anne, who it says here's Anne Hodgson, belonged to the Church of England. So there's one clue that I'm going to maybe find John, even though he's not a Quaker in the U.S., in Quaker records in the UK. And then it says there were left in England two brothers, Richard and Samuel. So obviously I'm looking for a family now that has a John, a Richard, and a Samuel. Which fortunately Richard and Samuel are unusual enough names even at this point that it's not like it's a John, James, and Thomas. Um, so this is what I have to go on for who was his family in England. So this is pulling out of that what I know, that John and his family arrived in the U.S. in 1801. He was a Quaker. His wife's name was Ann Hodgson. She belonged to the Church of England. John had brothers named Richard and Samuel. And also in that sheet, it says Richard had served in the English Army, including serving at Waterloo. So my brain says, okay, Quaker records are pretty good. Um, little early for good immigration records. They really, you know, ship captains were not required to keep passenger lists until 1820. So probably not going to find a passenger list for him. And by the early 1800s, there should be some trace of him in army records. And it would be really nice if I could find birth records for the two brothers, the names, parents the same as John's. But first, let me walk you through some of, and some of this is just the fun stories I found about my family. Um, so think of this as a sort of, elaborated on case study to some extent. So first bit of luck I got, here's a, um, the, a New York City newspaper that lists this ship, the Mars, Captain R. Sheffield came from Liverpool, took 52 days and a cargo of dry goods and such some, and some coal and here's all the list of passengers. Look who's listed. So 
1802, not 1801, but, you know, for something written 125 years later, that's reasonable accuracy in these things. So no, pass, no official ship passenger list, but at this point, this particular newspaper listed off everyone who'd gotten off, or at least some of the people who got off this ship. So, you know, don't give up is part of what I, this is. is. You know, this only came, this particular um, newspaper only came online two or three years ago. And it was just a random, because Leroy is an unusual enough name, every few months I do go through and say, what new newspapers are there? And because there'd been a comment on that typescript that he'd been in Albany first, I, make, I was making sure, because if he went from Yorkshire to Albany, New York, there's a really good chance at this time that he would have gone into New York City because overland from a New England port would not have been fun. You know, there was no nice mass pike to, so going up the Hudson would have made much more sense. So how he ended up going from Albany, New York to Boston, I have not figured out. But, you know, I figure this is better than I could have expected. Oh, did I do it again, Sharon? Sorry. Technology and I are not always best friends. So anyway, what happened with John Leroy is when they'd been in Boston five or six years, he and his son and two other men who were friends go out for a nice little pleasure cruise on a Sunday afternoon and there's a squall and they die. And again, just searching Leroy, I get this broadside owned by Yale that this entire poem, it's on your handout, isn't quite saying they got what they deserved because they went out for a pleasure trip on the Sabbath but it comes really close. But I mean, how often, so you've got the, you've got four little coffins here for the four, the three men and one boy who died. How's that for a, a find? You know, this is why it is sometimes worth Googling, especially the unusual names in your tree. So we move a few, a couple generations later and here we have my great grandfather who was struck by a passing streetcar, um, leg broken, taken to the hospital. So I periodically, again, I talk to patrons and say, you know, have you searched the newspapers? And say, oh, my ancestors wouldn't have been in the newspapers. Well, the truth behind this, he was drunk. He was an alcoholic at this point in his life. He and my great grandmother got married and their first kid came five months later. And this was when the first kid was a baby. And you, know, you can picture the stress. So here's an interesting thing. This is at newspapers.com, looking at blue roids as reference, as indexed by newspapers.com. What do you notice? Yeah. So when I do newspaper searches on Leroy, I tend to do from the beginning of the database to 1895, and then 1898 to whenever I'm interested in finishing. And here's why. Albert was a farmer, his wife, my great-grandmother, Jessie. As I said, they had to get married. They got married, had three kids quickly. Um, there was a hired hand named William Kennedy who thought that Albert was not treating Jessie well and so put rough on rats in Albert's tea. 
essentially arsenic in Albert's tea. That was in November of 1896. The trial was in January of 1897. And that's that spike in the newspapers, which is why I search before and after a lot of the time. Because if I don't, all I get are things about the trial. And look, you know, you've got out in Connecticut, I th there, there are snippets about this trial out in places like Wichita and you know, Dallas and places like that. You know, often quite little things like this, but it's all over the place. So those two years do not give me an accurate rendition of how often Leroy is was in the news. So yeah, this is him. Um, after the trial, he evidently sobered up. Um, he and, oh, going back to the trial, it's interesting, tabloids are not new. Um, some of the newspapers hint really heavily that my great-grandmother knew what was going on. Others treat her as this poor, innocent lady who this awful man did this to her husband. I don't know the truth. Um, I did not have much interaction with my grandfather's family growing up because my, we'll see why in a minute. Um, but evidently he did sober up and then six years after the trial, my grandfather was born. So I'm glad they stayed together. <laughs> um, then here's this, this is my grandparents. They got divorced. Um, this is before no fault divorce. I'm not sure how much of this I believe. Um, I have shared a house with my grandmother. I'm not sure the fault was entirely on my grandfather's side in this. Um, excuse the language, but my grandmother was a dry drunk who tended to be a manipulative bitch with some a wide streak of narcissism. Um, She's my grandmother. I loved her, but, you know, there were things that, let's just say, I, she was a lot easier to love from 400 miles away. <laughs> so, you know, again, this is the era where there was not no-fault divorce. So, but here's the, one of the reasons I show this. This is my grandfather's gravestone. This is wife number two. Um, this is from the, he, after they got married, he and wife number two got married, they moved down to North Carolina, which is why my mother didn't see much of them, because she was still in, in the Boston area. You'll notice here, he's, my grandfather is survived by his wife, two sons, his father, a brother, and a sister. My mother is not mentioned. Obviously, wife number two was the source for this. So there's no mention of my mother by wife number one. So, you know, dysfunctional families are not a creation of the 1960s. But this is one reason you want to think about, you know, why was this record generated? And, you know, if I hadn't known this was the right family, and I was looking, you know, let's say this was a family named Smith. I might go, oh, yeah, you know, that's not them. My mother's not there. So this is where it gets interesting. So we have um, the 1940 census. He, my grandfather's still listed with um, my grandmother and my mother. And if any of you are wondering what the B and BJ stands for, you can probably figure it out at this point. Um, according to an online tree by a nephew that I don't know, on the other side of his family, he married wife number two in May of 1940. Their first child was born in March of 41. That newspaper article I showed you about the trial was in November of 41. In 1942, so compiled, late 41, 
he's still listed in the city directory with my grandmother. So yeah, we've got this a little tangled here. <laughs> I'm still working on trying to figure this out, exactly the order things happened. Um, I think both sides did a little fudging. I think my grandmother probably fudged the city directory and put that my grandfather may have fudged how free he was to remarry. So, you know, that's just how life goes. Um, my grandfather's aunt, um, the sister of the victim in the poisoning, was um, very prominent in teaching. She was an instructor at the Salem Normal School, which is now the Salem State College in Salem, Massachusetts. She evidently was the sort of instructor who made almost every one of her students cry at some point. And my mother had to go to school with this distinctive last name that all of her teachers had studied with. I'm sometimes really surprised how sane my mother turned out. <laughs> um, but again, you know, things, it's worth Googling the name because you get, you know, I have a, a, a spreadsheet with all of the mentions in newspapers. You know, name, date, you know, a couple words summary. You know, so a lot of them just say garden club meeting so that I know what it was when, if anyone were to ever ask me about it. Um, so yeah, these, the other funny story is she, if you look on the family tree, my grandfather's wife was Jesse. My great grandfather's wife was Jesse. His sister was Jesse. So they were both, one was Jesse Putnam Leroy as her birth name, and the other was Jesse Sears, who married a Leroy. And evidently, Aunt Jess was a bit of a character and had quite the gardening outfit with this weird hat and an oversized shirt of her father's. And I don't even, my mother, unfortunately, is no longer here for me to finish the description. Um, and my grand, great grandmother by this point in the 50s was pretty much a recluse. And so the minister heard that Jesse Leroy had died and thought it was my aunt Jess and was going to the house to offer condolences. You know, turning out it was my great grandmother. So my aunt Jess is out in the garden and pops up behind bushes from behind bushes with this, you know, odd gardening outfit and evidently scares the minister <laughs> because she's still alive and it was the other Jesse Leroy who wasn't still alive. Um, but, you know, these stories are the sort of thing that, you know, got me going on wanting to know more. So let's get back to England for a bit. So as I said, I found this. Makes perfect sense that he left from Liverpool if he's coming from Yorkshire. And it was really nice. I went and some of the Quaker records were some of the first things online. Um, although I think I actually found it, I found this back when you had to do microfilm before you could get it online. And so this is a Quaker meeting, that Brig House meeting in Yorkshire. Look, John Leroy's, oops. Son of Amos Leroy of Allerton in the parish of Bradford and County of York, Clothier, and Rachel, his wife, was born the 26th of 10th month in 1772. So pretty good age to be marrying Anne Hodgson in the late 1790s. You know, mid-20s, getting married. But, you know, this isn't necessarily proof that it's him. I mean, I've got a Quaker John Leroy, but there were other John Leroy's. And um, so I said, I wonder if they're brothers, the way I've been told. 
oh, and here's the thought at Waterloo. Um, I haven't actually looked at Samuel that much yet, um, just because you know, there's only so much time in a day. And lo and behold, here in same Brig House monthly meeting, Richard, son of Amos Leroy of Allerton in the parish of Bradford, clothier, and Rachel, his wife, was born in 1775. So same parents, same monthly meeting, pretty good chance these two are brothers. And then there's Samuel comes along two years later. So, you know, not definitive proof, but I think it's a pretty good hypothesis theory at this point that they go together. This I only found a couple, again, this record wasn't online until a couple years ago. And I was getting really frustrated because I had no idea where they were married. Well, it turns out they were married at the cathedral in Bradford. And this is a, this page is actually the bands, you know, the, the marriage intentions. And here you have John Leroy and Ann Hodgson were published. They give the dates of the bands, um, give a couple witnesses, which is nice. Um, Holmes is actually John's mother's maiden name. So it's just another little piece of support that this is the same extended family. And that this is the John Leroy who was the Quaker child with the mother, Rachel Holmes, because he's got a Holmes here. Again, not proof in and of itself, but if you're trying to put together a case, seems like a pretty good fit there. And then you also have the book that listed the actual marriages. And there we are, John Leroy and Ann Hodgson. No other details. I'm still stuck on her. Ann Hodgson isn't quite Mary Brown, but in that part of Yorkshire is close enough to that kind of name that without a further bit of detail, I don't know what else I can do. Oops. Um, so that's, that's tough. I don't know anything more about her. Um, the Quakers did keep good records. Some are completely handwritten. Other meetings have, um, pre-printed forms, so that's nice. Um, marriage records, Quaker marriage records are wonderful if you have a family who were Quaker. And they all pretty much start out the same way. And it says Amos Leroy of Allerton, son of Amos Leroy, late of Allerton aforesaid in Bradford, Yorkshire, Yeoman and Eleanor, his wife. So that's identifying Amos and his parents. Now, in Rachel Holmes, daughter of Thomas Holmes, late of Denton in the parish of Otley in county of York, also a yeoman, and Rachel, his wife, both deceased. So you get this nice little family grouping at the beginning, which is really helpful. We know that. Um, all but Eleanor of the four parents are deceased because it says so. So that this 1769 record tells us that three of the four parents in this case are already deceased. Here's the other fun little bit. If we go back here, at a, at a friend's wedding, everyone who's there signs the marriage certificate because they don't have a minister these are all the witnesses. So here's the rightmost column from that certificate. And you can go through, and this is where the family signs. They start on that rightmost column. So for Rachel, we have her um, three brothers, another brother, a couple brothers-in-law, a sister, and then various other relations. 
And for Amos, we have his mother, because we knew that one of the four parents was still alive, and it's his mother, Eleanor, his brother, Nehemiah, a sister, Ellen, and a sister who at this point is Grace Mortimer. She had married a man with the last name Mortimer. So again, this rightmost column is a nice little genealogical summary. And in fact, this last one, this Isabella Hoyland, is interesting because she is the aunt by marriage of Rachel's mother. And so it took, it's like, but it's not the marriage that made her the aunt by marriage. By this point, that husband has died and she's married another man. But again, you can track, I can track it back and add to the, you know, for those of you who've heard about, you know, a fan club of family associates and neighbors, this is helpful for tracking that fan club. It actually helped me figure out which Rachel Milner was Rachel Holmes's mother because only one of them had a sister named Isabella of the various Milner families I found that had a Rachel. So, you know, if you see Quaker marriage records, check it. It's not, this isn't one, it's like naming patterns. It's not 100% absolutely true, but it's going to give you a bit of a head start if you look at that rightmost column on the Quaker records. Does that make sense to everybody? And you find this with other records where, you know, um, ancestry is wonderful, but, and I say this as a librarian, sometimes a book is a really good thing where you go and read about, you know, who were the witnesses to a baptism? Was it the parents' generation? Was it the grandparents' generation? And there are different, you know, in, I was one of my study groups on genealogy last night. We were reading a Swedish study, and none of us had done work in Sweden, so we were looking things up. And traditionally, evidently, and so, I know a couple of you have do Swedish research, I think. Um, it was often four, four witnesses or sponsors to a baptism, an unmarried man, a married man, an unmarried woman, and a married woman. Not always, but you know, the, the woman whose article we were reading had really used witnesses and the standard type of witness. To, and it, it was a really interesting article. Um, and so knowing, sometimes reading the book about what was typical. You know, my Scottish Presbyterian ancestors never gave me six witnesses to a baptism. It was two. And it was often the child's aunt or great aunt as one of them. Um, so that's why sometimes reading a bit of background is worth it. You could also get married in England by bands. This is another Leroy. Um, it doesn't happen to be one of my direct line, but they're all related. So I, you know, collecting them all. Um, you also get death records. Um, Again, they don't give as much detail as you'd like at this point, but the record's actually there. And so here we have Eleanor, um, widow of Amos Leroy, late of Allerton and the palace, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, but it gives you enough information to know that this is the Eleanor who was married to the Amos that I'm interested in. With Quakers, you actually often also get burial records because what they did is they'd fill this out, give it to the grave maker who would then sign it and give it back. Now in Scotland, some of you have probably hear me, heard me talk about mort cloths before. Anyone know what a mort cloth is? Okay, in 1800, it took a week's worth of work to make a yard of fabric, whether you worked for money and paid somebody for a yard of fabric or you made it yourself. By 1840, with industrialization, that had gone down to about an hour, which is essentially where it stayed since then. Well, in Scotland, Scotland is a poor country, 
And um, rather than buying a shroud every time someone died, the parish had a mort cloth, a death cloth that you could rent for the funeral. And until they went to put the body in the ground, they'd take off the mort cloth, wash it, and rent it for the next funeral. So the records you find in Scotland before about 1850 are as likely to be mort cloth rentals as actual death records. How's that for an interesting little bit of trivia? So then there's some other records, and I'm getting close to the end of the, so those of you who are falling asleep can wake up again. So again, we go back to Richard. With this, he fought at Waterloo. Um, so I, one of the first things I do when I'm looking at somebody who lives into the 19th century, I look for newspaper records. And here we have Richard Leroy, late captain of the 82nd Regiment of Infantry. He'd served in many years in the Peninsular War under the Duke of Wellington. He'd retired from the army. Here he is in a different newspaper. And if we do the math, that's exactly the birth year we had on that Quaker birth record. Again, not solid proof that this is the same one referred to in that typescript, but pretty likely. And see here, 1775. And it's a reason to keep looking at all of them. You'll notice here, this one, if we go back here, they just say it is House Great Horton. And this one just says of Bradford. This one says of Craig Cottage Horton near Bradford. So I'd be able, I actually have gone and found that cottage on one of the ordnance survey maps. That was, this is from 1843. They were surveyed in the late 1840s. So I can put that, co place that cottage and then do the, Thing with the geo-referencing and see the modern. He got married. Um, it's in the Dublin paper for some reason. Um, they had 92nd instead of 82nd, but again, for the time period, that's close enough. It's a typo. It's, it's the, the factual equivalent of a deviant rather than a variant. Um, so that is why you keep looking because I could have, this, this one was about seven pages into the results after a bunch of not relevant results. Um, so, you know, it's worth keeping going. So I looked up the 82nd, um, turns out they were not at Waterloo, um, but he had been, they were on the, um, Let's see where it was it. They returned to Britain 10 days after, but they did spend the rest of that year as part of the army occupation in Paris. He had, again, earlier fought in Spain and Gibraltar. Um, so again, it's that whole you know, family stories are 75% right often or 50% right, but you know, I would put this in more right than not, even though it, it said he, that typescript said he fought at Waterloo. Does that make, would, would you guys agree that that's, you know, he had this, the, whoever did the typescript had the spirit of his service, even if he missed that exact detail. But if you think about it, someone was typing that 110 years later, and that's what, three or four generations of story being told and cro probably crossing the Atlantic in the meantime, which means you don't have multiple people you're hearing it from, you're just hearing it from your grandfather instead of your grandfather and six aunts. But the other thing I wanted to point out about this is it's you know all sorts of places that you can verify information, find more. You know, there's a National Army Museum in the UK, which is different than the Imperial War Museum. 
which is different from various regimental museums. But they've all got interesting information. A um, couple of, you know, you get other things. This one is someone who was not born a Leroy, but his mother was. So his middle name is Leroy. He ended up the dean of Harvard Divinity School. Um, and this is another minister who was a Leroy. It's interesting that a lot of them ended up as ministers. Because there are a couple of the ones from this family that stayed in the UK. One was a Methodist and one was a Church of England minister. And so when I go to Archive Grid and search at Leroy, I get 72 hits. The first two are the Divinity School collections. And further down the list, because he was a Harvard professor, you have some records in the Harvard University archive that's about the running of the university, and some in the general Harvard archive, as well as the Divinity School. So you, know, you may get multiple collections from somebody, depending on the different parts of where their papers got put. You get other things. This is from a woman accusing a Leroy of fathering her illegitimate child. And they were trying to track down. You'll notice everything where there's an arrow is something about money. You know, we, we tend to think it's all morality. But the written record says it's about money, when there's a kid whose parents aren't married at this time. <laughs> that makes sense that that's what they were worried about. They didn't want the parish church to have to pay for this kid. So they went after the father for the money. These are now a lot of the Yorkshire and several other counties Bastardy records are now at Ancestry, by the way. Um, you get business records. This is a case of three brothers are dissolving their partnership, and then the two brothers are carrying on. I'm pretty sure this is actually um, the same Richard. I'm not certain, though. Um, it may be, I think, actually, no, sorry, I think it may be a cousin who had these two brothers, and he's basically hitting retirement age at this point. And the two brothers are like 13 and 17 years younger, so they want to keep, they're, they're basically buying out the brother who's ready to retire. You get convict transportations, which is why there are also Leroy's in Australia that I have in my database. Um, so looking at back at what I knew from that sheet, well, they were close. They were a year off. Got that, got that, got that, got that, and got half of that in the Army, but not at Waterloo. So this is about how family stories come out, more or less, in terms of accuracy. And there's also Society for One Place Studies. Um, and yes, I'm doing a one place study. And actually, I'm on the board of directors for this one. <laughs> so I kind of felt I had to put a plug in for, for it. Um, so questions. I hope I didn't bore you guys. OK, let me, let me bring out the mic. Well, that's that's a modern organization. Oh. It's not a, a traditional field. It's the modern, essentially, Society for One Name Studies. So we don't know how far back, how far back. They, they don't hold, hold their own records. It's, a, it's an organization of those of us doing one name studies, not an old guild. You had a slide with several um, newspaper clippings on it, and you said you had searched Google for that. Do you get newspaper results in Google well, sometimes? you can, but I didn't search that. For, I think there's another one where I searched Google. Because uh -huh. most of these newspapers come out of either newspapers.com. Mm 
or well, actually, Chronicling America and Google News work together. Um, but most of these were from newspapers.com. Thank you. Um, but yet, general Google's are worth, you know, general Google search is worth doing because they do search some things that you'd be surprised at. But what not was the other Google? What was the other Google thing that you mentioned? Google. Google News, News oh. is a subset of the Google search. And they work with Chronicling America, which is the Library of Congress newspaper digitizing project. Thank you. I was going to comment about the uh, the bastardy issue. Um, my great grandmother was born out of wedlock, so as they say, in North Carolina, which was very zealous at pursuing uh, the fathers of children born in that circumstance. And the one way that I found uh, uh, clues about my, actually my great grandmother's birth year, or birth date, because I had eight different possible dates from other sources was in the bastardy file that I hired someone to go to the courthouse to find, which is actually now online at Ancestry. Um, and here's the record, and it says, you know, this child was delivered on such and such a date mm -hmm. uh, in 1870 in North Carolina. So um, if you've got a situation like that, uh, if, if somebody is enforcing that kind of thing, and it was exactly what you said, this was because they didn't want the county to be responsible for this child. They wanted to make sure that mom was going to have a source of income. Mm -hmm. And the man who swore the bond out that he would guarantee this was her late husband's uh, co-worker in the Civil War. They fought in the same unit together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my great-grandmother was also born such that where her father's name should be, it says illegitimate. And this was in 1864 in a mill town in Southern Scotland where somewhere between a quarter and a third of kids were actually born without the parents married. Um, and that happened in some of the mill towns in New England as well, um, because where you get a bunch of young women, you get both a bunch of young men and some middle-aged men in power, and nature takes its course. But yeah, it's it's often, yeah, like in the, the Scottish Kirk Session records, yes, they talk about the immorality, but it's also who is the father so we can ask for money. So is does that um, Guild of One Name Studies include any other nationalities or is it just pretty much it's British? It's a lot of others, but it, it started in the UK okay. and so is kind of focused there. Um, so, and you do have parts of the world you know, that don't have surnames or don't have, you know, the certain Asian countries, you know, half the population is, la their last name is Kim or Park in Korea. So you're not going to have the same kind of obscure names you get in rural England. Or, you know, I've got a couple actually here in, in the U.S. that I might do if I ever think I've got the Leroyd study well underway. So I'm one of the newer people to genealogy in the room. So I don't mean to bore you guys, but um, your surname distribution map, I've heard you talk about that before on your videos because I've watched a lot of your videos. Is it reasonable to try to do a surname distribution map for the last name of Johnston yeah. in the U.S. in 1840 and it, 1850? It, it, there's a, yeah, it's always worth checking because there are s some names that still are surprisingly geographically, you know, I would guess that a name like Johnston, you're going to find in Pennsylvania and along the Appalachian Ridge. That's where the family was, but there's so many David Johnstons, I'm going nuts. <laughs> you know, and, and so you get something from that in the sense of, 
you know, there are names that don't have a distribution, but you know, if my great grandfather hadn't been adopted, my name would be McGee. And even in Scotland and Ireland, it, it's a name that has a very clear distribution pattern, which you know you wouldn't think a name like that would, but um, it's it's always worth trying. You may not get anything, and you know, certainly those top ten or fifteen names you're probably not going to. But I think you know, once you get down below the top hundred, it's almost always worth trying just to see. Okay. And it's definitely if you have a married couple. Like one of the things I did with one of the families I'm searching in Ireland, where the two names are a little unusual, I did the distribution for both. And there were only a couple places where you had both within 10 miles of each other. And it turns out that now that I found some records that that couple was indeed from one of those 10 mile chunks. That would be awesome because you know they're just they're you know it wasn't Murphy or <laughs> Sullivan those would not work. Yeah. But actually, there are some names. It I think it's Murphy and Kelly actually do have some distribution attribute. You know, there are parts of Ireland where you don't get Murphy. It's just like certain part. You know, it's it's interesting that there are even some fairly common names that there are distribution patterns for. Okay. And then the other question I had was the uh, newspaper article dis curve with the spike in it. I don't, I'm not a, a subscriber to newspapers.com at this time. Is it, is that easy to do on oh, newspaper.com? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's one of the easier ways to narrow a search there actually. Okay. Um, and you can do that. It's a little harder to do at my heritage. Um, which all of you, if you start at library.digitalmain.org, have access to at home. Hmm. The state library pays for georeferencing. Um, it is dot org, right? Yeah. Um, it's where all of the li li state library's databases are. Um, Ancestry, you have to use in the library, but anything else there pretty much you can use at home. Um, and there's a lot there. The other thing, if you're interested in any of the social history, you know, historical demography, things like that, next time you're in Bangor, stop and get a Bangor library card. It's free if you have, live in the state of Maine, and they subscribe to a service called JSTOR, which it really is indexing um, a lot of the history and sociology type journals and you have full article access through the Bangor Library. So, you know, if a doctor's appointment or something takes you up there, swing by the library and get a card and you can renew it over the phone. You don't have to go back in, but it's, it's worth having. They also, unlike the state library, they pay for the regular consumer report so if you've got a library card with them, you can access consumer reports online. The way we have it at the state library, it's a quirky, clunky database, but they just have the regular sign in to the, <laughs> so. It's library.digitalmain.org. Sharon, maybe when you send out the recording, maybe you could put that in the, in the if you wouldn't mind. Because it is, you know, the, the my heritage. There are ways in which I it's not as good as ancestry, but we pay for it because it lets you use it at home. One of the things they do have, they have pretty much the entire run of the Lewiston paper from the 1860s to about 2006 or so, and because of where Lewiston was in the state, both geographically and demographically. They picked up a lot from around the state, and I have used it as an index, like for some, even back when I was here, and it was up, you know, people would come in, and it would be something like a, a car accident in the 1950s that they didn't have an exact date for, and we'd go find the, the two-sentence blurb in, in the Lewiston paper, 
but that gave us the date to go look at the Republican Journal instead of having to look through years. Um, the, uh, and in their newspapers, they also have, um, they worked with the Boston Public Library to get Boston Public's newspapers digitized. And again, I have found so much going up and down the coast that, you know, if you're looking for people who were here, you know, Belfast, Camden, Rockland, there's a good chance if something interesting happened to your ancestor in this area, that it ended up in one of the you know, Salem, Boston, you know, Newburyport, all of those newspapers, because it really was the superhighway. <laughs> so, you know, particularly in those early newspapers where the main ones come and go and aren't as, as well digitized as we'd like because their runs of six months or something sets all the papers survive. The, the Massachusetts papers can be a huge help. So. I will say this is about, this is distilling down 25 years of researching. Um, and just, I figured I, I'd tell you a bit and then show you how to apply some of it so that you would be able to go home and try it yourself.